into the PCMG mailing list. And uh, the topic has also been part of the PCMG committee that we identified last year on our planning day. It's a topic that's very close to my heart and I'm really looking forward to the two presentations being covered off from today. To myself and Debbie Hall, Debbie's on camera as well, who is the head of programme delivery from the University of Huddersfield, have jointly set up this webinar and we got, have got support as always from the PCMG committee. So um, in this afternoon session, we have two presentations, roughly around 25 minutes each, which includes question time. So I'm going to introduce you to Karen Lang. Karen is from the University of St. Andrews and is the Deputy Director of Business Transformation, which provides support services to portfolios, programmes and projects across the university and is responsible for the effective and efficient operation of portfolio management practices. A key part of Karen's role is drafting the five-year portfolio plan, maintaining portfolio resource scheduling, preparing the portfolio dashboard and development of prioritisation and complexity models. In Karen's presentation today, she'll cover off how you create an operational plan from a strategic aim and how you get from ideation to a prioritised delivery schedule. So welcome, Karen, and over to you. Thank you, Marguerite, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I will just share my slides and just make sure you can all see them. Yeah, they look good, Karen. Perfect. OK, so like Marguerite said, um, I'm going to try and just share with you some of the approaches that St Andrews have um, brought into place and what's working um, effectively and not for us. Um, before I jump into that, I thought it might be useful just to share a bit of context in terms of how we are structured at St Andrews. So in terms of governance, we have a strategic portfolio board. And they look after all the highly complex transformational projects that are going on across the institution. And then underneath that, we also have some hub portfolios. We've got quite a well-established hub portfolio in our education and student experience um, area. And we've got a few emerging hub portfolios that we're working on setting up at the moment. The difference between those levels is complexity. So highly complex projects sit with our strategic portfolio board, less complex sit in the hub portfolio um, space. And we have um, some some criteria, criteria that we use to assess where they sit. Um, we then also have a business transformation team. Now, they sit as an independent professional service unit in the university. They don't sit as part of any other space. We did very initially back in the day start off in IT, but very quickly moved to being an independent unit. The team is um, about 25 at the moment. We've got a couple of vacancies. Um, we've got some roles that support that whole governance structure. And then we have got two teams that are split um, in terms of supporting management of the portfolios and delivery. So one that sits directly supporting the business transformation board and then another team that look after the hub portfolios. Um, so just so that when we're going through um, what I discussed today, you understand kind of the context that sits around that. Our business transformation board's been in place since 2015, um, so quite mature. Hub portfolios is more of a, a recent addition to our governance structure. And so most of what I'm going to share with you today in terms of the approaches we've got in place are at that business transformation board level. But I will touch a little bit on what we're doing at the hub portfolio level as well. So when we started uh, working with the Business Transformation Board back in 2015, we were a team of two um, and there were multiple challenges facing us and we couldn't deal with them all, all at once. So I thought maybe so just to take you through the approach we've taken in terms of building to where we're at at the moment. Um, so when we started working with them in 2015, and I'm sure these challenges will resonate with a, a huge amount of you, too many projects going on. We did, had no idea, um, we didn't have full visibility of everything that was going on. We There wasn't always a clear business case sitting underneath all the projects that were being taken forward. We had no idea how they were aligning with strategy. We didn't know what benefits they were delivering. They didn't have plans in terms of expectations of resources, budgets, timelines. That gave us no way to prioritise and understand if we were taking forward the right things. We had no agreed project methodology that they were all following and we had no dedicated change delivery resource so we had people trying to deliver these large scale transformation projects on top of their day job and with no support training etc in terms of how to approach that and on top of all of that um, and that huge amount of um, stuff we were doing too much all at the same time 
there was constant new ideas coming at us as well. And everybody thought their idea was the most important and highest priority and needed to be taken forward right now. And we had no way to judge where those new ideas sat within the portfolio of all the stuff that was already ongoing and planned. Now, we couldn't tackle all of that at once. So we took a deliberate decision to take a staged approach as to how we did that. And one of the first things we did was created visibility as to what was going on via and the introduction of a portfolio dashboard. And that was um, integrated into the papers that went to our portfolio board. It started giving them a bit of a view as to what was going on and how it was going. And it started to give us a bit better control as to what was happening. And in tandem with that, we introduced a project methodology specific for St Andrews so that the people that were delivering projects had some sort of support and some sort of toolkit they could pick up. And that helped us actually start to get a bit of control um, over how things were being delivered and get it into a slightly better place. By no means fixed everything and certainly wasn't perfect, but it was a, a sort of good starting point for us. It also started to let the portfolio board see the types of challenges projects were facing in terms of why they were taking longer spending more money etc etc and one of the key things that came from that was they started to understand the need to put some dedicated change delivery resource in in place to be able to take those things forward one of the key things we did in terms of trying to get a bit more control over those ideas then that were constantly coming at us and um, we did two key things one we made them all come in through the same you know front door and in the same way. So we created a template where people could submit their ideas. And one of the key questions we asked them within that proposal template was how their idea aligned and was helping us deliver against the university strategy. So that to give us that view um, of strategic alignment of the things that were in the portfolio. But we also tried to tackle when the ideas were coming at us because it was very hard to create a plan and understand what came next, when things were bubbling up all the time. So we also tried to address how ideas, not just how ideas were coming in, but when they were coming in as well. Um, and all of that has enabled us over the last sort of two, three years to think about introducing a bit more co comprehensive and robust framework for prioritising and understanding what we should be putting our resources into and taking forward. Now, we've not waited till the last two years to introduce the concept of prioritisation. We have been having those conversations from day one with the Portfolio Board. Um, it's just how we've been having those conversations has really evolved and changed over time. Um, and they have started to understand, based on the information they were getting to see, the, the need for something. Um, before that, it was a bit of a touchy-feely, what do you think is the right thing to take forward what do you think the the sort of priorities um are so we've not ignored it but it's definitely become um, more robust over the last couple of years now for me that <clears throat> getting control over how those ideas were coming to us has been a really key um step for unlocking being able to utilize the prioritization framework in a really easy clear um way so how did we do that we were really lucky in terms of there was a new university strategy launched in 2022, covering a five-year period. And out the back of that new university strategy being signed off, the business transformation team were asked to support um, pulling together action plans so that we knew what we actually had to do and deliver in terms of change projects to deliver a, that actual university strategy and all the objectives that are contained within there. So that was a really useful exercise. It gave us a really long list of here's all the things we need to now do and, and they're all strategically aligned. They're all the things that are going to deliver um, the university strategy. We were then able to look at each of those ideas and assess what size and shape do we think they are? Where should they then go for delivery? Do they go to that business transformation portfolio? Do they sit in one of our hubs? Are they in a governance structure that we actually don't even support? But at least we knew kind of roughly where those things were sitting. And although we have a, an idea of a sort of five year plan underpinning our university strategy, it is refreshed on an annual basis. We also have an annual school and unit planning process in place across the institution. And we were able to work with the committees that run that and explain to them the impact it was having of those ideas coming at us from all over the place at any point of the year. And um, so we were able to work with them and get some questions put into that school and unit planning process in terms of identifying um, what people thought they needed to take forward in the coming year and also aligning that in terms of timeline so that all the ideas that were coming from all these various different places we're all landing at roughly the same time. 
And then we've also worked really closely with our colleagues in IT to understand the IT roadmap over the next few years. So what um, systems do we have? Where the contract's going to be coming up for renewal? Do we have an idea of where maybe some products are going to be sunsetted, moved to the cloud, etc.? That's a really big input into what comes into our portfolio. So we've worked really closely with them and that gives us a bit of a view. And we've tried really hard to look at the timeline that sits around all of that and aligned it with university's financial planning process because the budget question around all of this is really important and that's really helped our CFO also do better financial planning. So we try to align all of that so that it lands about April time and in April we have this really long list of ideas as to what we think we need to take forward in the coming years and we're then able to use that as the key input into our prioritisation framework and then a plan coming out the back of that. The other thing we take into account there is the hub portfolios and what's coming out of that space as well. And there is always still stuff going to bubble up um, throughout the year. You can never get away from that. But the frameworks that we've introduced are helping us deal with that in a slightly better way than we had before. So what have we done then in terms of taking all that and, and introducing a framework to actually prioritise it and make sure we're taking the right things forward? So we've built a framework. Um, it's based on ROI, so return on investment and it's got three key components built into it. We look at time and cost, we look at benefits and disbenefits, and we look at the risk to that project being successfully delivered, basically the business case that sits underneath the idea. For each of the elements then that are sitting underneath those headers, we have components sitting within the framework, scales um, that are allocated scores. So for example, how long something's going to take, we've got a sliding scale, we look at what our estimate is for where that's going to sit, it gives it a score. And so for each of those elements, a score is generated in the framework. We have, um, we look at the types and level of benefit that we're expecting to be delivered from that project. And we have six defined benefit categories that are set by our portfolio board. And within the framework, we have included the ability to weight those benefit categories. So if our portfolio boards care about specific types of benefits more than others at any point, we're able to uh, pull that in and the score generates from that. Um, we look at the payback period that comes from benefits as well in terms of when we expect them to be realised and then we look at the risk profile sitting against that initiative and how likely it is to deliver. All of that comes together and generates a score for each project um, and then that is then also put into a scale which generates a high, medium and low category. Now we have built that whole framework with our portfolio board. They've been completely involved in the conversations. They've signed off on the components that are in the framework. When we introduced it for the first time, we actually got them to use the framework and put all the scores in so that it built confidence with them that it was doing the right thing and they understood how it all actually operated. They now just leave us to get on with it, but they understand that what's sitting underneath what they get given is really robust and they're happy with how it's been built. And the other thing I would say is that as well as having that categorisation of high, medium and low, having a score is also really important because it helps us differentiate between things that are all sitting in the same category. Sometimes we don't even have enough resources to take forward all the high priority initiatives. So having that score really helps us differentiate at that level. Um, now, that's then a key input into us building a plan that we know is aligned with our strategy and is going to deliver the results the university wants. But there are a few other things that we take into consideration when we're building that plan. Priority score is, you know, the first fundamental one. But the other things that we look at and think about, sorry, that's a bit of a um, view of our prioritisation framework. It's built on Excel. It's got a fair bit of intelligence built in behind the scenes um, so that the scores automatically pull through. It automatically categorises as high, medium and low. It's got various different tabs. This is the, a view of the main one. And one of the, the key tabs is we produce a summary view for our portfolio board. So they don't need to see all the details sitting behind, but they get to see um, how the scores have come out and where things are categorised. So quite a simple concept, but it's working really well. And then the other things that we take into consideration then and before we actually take a plan forward is we look at that maintain, enhance, transform model. So sometimes something might not come out as the highest priority, but actually we need to do it just to maintain current services. So we allocate this to each of our initiatives. We think about the resources that are sitting across all those different initiatives. 
we might have two high priority initiatives, but they both need the same resource um, profile sitting against them, and it's not possible to do that at the same time. So we take that into consideration. Think about the budget and making sure we're maximising the use of the portfolio budget that we have. We think about the types of benefits that are being released, and in particular, we think about efficiency and revenue growth benefits. Sometimes if we can get them released from an initiative, they can be reinvested to take forward something else. We look at dependencies. We always have that view of strategic alignment and what's delivering against our strategy. And we also are mindful of what's happening in our hub portfolios. And in particular, the changes that are being delivered from both spaces and making sure we're not overburdening the same area of the university with change coming at them from multiple different portfolios at the same time. So taking that all into account, they, we then create a five-year portfolio plan. That plan is refreshed on an annual basis, it's signed off by our portfolio board, and then it is monitored on a monthly basis via the portfolio dashboard. And all of the initiatives in this portfolio can be tracked back up to the objectives sitting in the university strategy and vice versa. So we can look at our university strategy and see what projects are contributing to it. And we can look at the projects and see which element of the strategy they are contributing to. And um, so that gives you know a bit of confidence to the board as to how things are going. The prioritization framework doesn't stop there. So although we use it on that annual basis, underpinning this plan in particular, things change and move within a year. So that prioritisation framework sits there in the background being utilised all the time. When we put that data into our prioritisation framework at the start of the year, a lot of the estimates are very high level at that point because we've not done a huge amount of work on the project. So as that business case develops and goes through the stage gates, we update and refine the information and we check that that's not you know, hugely change the priority score or category of the initiative. We confirm that to the portfolio board or if it's changed, it helps us have an informed decision with the board as to what we do around the plan. We still have ideas that bubble up throughout the year. We'll never get away from that. They go into the prioritisation framework. We then understand where they sit in relation to everything else that's already ongoing or planned. And again, we can then have a conversation with the board about what do we do. And sometimes the constraints we're working within change. So um, sometimes we can put options forward to our board in terms of the plan, give us a little bit more money, increase the resource in this space, we can take this forward. But at the moment, we're probably getting a bit, a bit tighter on that side of things and being constrained in terms of work within existing resource. If our budget is changed, having that you know, overview and sense of priorities really helps us react to that and let our portfolio board know what that means when they change the constraints that we're working within. And in terms of what we're doing next, so the work doesn't just stop, that framework has really helped us. It's been a massive game changer in terms of how we are planning and knowing we're utilising our resources in the right way across the institution. Um, we're then trying to introduce some of those standards at an appropriate level and slightly tailored for our hub portfolios for the types of projects that are in there. We're always looking at um, ongoing development of that framework and in particular at the moment we're looking at how some of those other considerations can be built into the framework rather than having to be um, thought about separately. Um, and we're also in the very early stages of building new business architecture services which we fully expect will feed back in and help all of this progress in hopefully a very positive way as well. So, whirlwind view of the journey we've been on um, at St Andrews, where we're currently at, um, is by no means perfect, but it's certainly, you know, a lot better than what it has been previously. So hopefully that's um, been helpful for some of you to just um, share that. Marguerite, hopefully Thank I've left friend. time for a few you questions. Know, we're good. Actually, I came in a bit early, so apologies for that. Um, I think it's um, really interesting what you've done around that framework, and I suppose it's given, it gives people, they all have to go through the same process. There's lots of questions coming in, so um, do you want to go first there, Simon? Is that is that me? Simon Simon Weaver, Weaver, yeah. Is that the yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Karen, for sharing that. That was really useful. Um, we are in a similar position at Montfort University where we are going through our portfolio design at the moment. We've made some progress, but we've got some challenges. And uh, <clears throat> it was interesting to see um, you share your journey. The question I just wanted to ask, it's about um, restructures and change management. So um, we've at the moment, we don't track restructure work through our strategic portfolio. 
and um, that's a historical decision before I joined and it's owned within people services. But I just wondered, do you track that restructure work through your strategic portfolio? And also, do you have any sort of change management resources specialists within your within your area as well? Because that's another thing that we're wrestling with at the moment is exactly where that change management piece sits alongside the delivery of those strategic projects. Thank you. OK, so <clears throat> by restructure, you mean a, a team being restructured and the institution and whether we would yeah, support correct, that yeah. as, a, as a project. Yeah, so we yeah. have had some come into our portfolio. So the move away from IT for us was incredibly deliberate so that the university didn't think we just did IT projects. So that that has, you know, helped raise the profile of we're here to help you transform, regardless of whether it's got an IT element um, or not. It would have to be some... Uh, a restructure that's complex enough to justify sitting within that portfolio but um, at the moment we have um, we have been supporting and running a project to merge two of our schools so we're creating a new business school in St Andrews and that's merging two of our academic schools together we've very much managed that project so yes we do have examples of that coming in um, sometimes it's things that don't justify sitting within the portfolio but we're maybe asked to give a bit of advice and support on in terms of how to take it forward so we have done a bit of sort of off to the side consultancy for some of those things as well um and your second question was change management so we don't have dedicated change management resource at the moment although it's something that we're looking at we've always very much embedded that into the roles of our project managers and business analysts but i think the size and shape of the stuff we've got in our portfolio at the moment is justifying that being a bit more full-bodied we did um second someone in for a year to help us with our finance transformation project which we've just finished delivering and that was really key actually and um, so we are looking at one of the vacancies we've got at the moment, refactoring that to be a change manager role. Thanks, uh, Karen. There's a few questions in the chat, so I'll go through those if that's okay. Um, this is from Ginny Beans. Uh, do you have any balancing of your portfolio, for example, run, grow, transform initiatives and the levels that can be incorporated within a portfolio cycle? Yeah, so I think that touches a little bit on that sort of maintain, transform, enhance um, model that we have been been looking at. Um, in an ideal world, we do try and look at balancing our portfolio, both using that, but also in other ways. So making sure that we are doing um, initiatives that are evenly spread across the institute as well. So we're doing stuff in the teaching and learning space. We're doing stuff in research. We're looking at our enabling capabilities. I think what's coming at us at the moment isn't really an al allowing us to do that to the extent that we we would need to. There's a lot of maintain going on just because of the size of IT change that's coming at us. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly have looked at that in the past. It does sit in the background and we would like to, um, you know, get more to that as well and introduce that as part of that annual portfolio cycle. Um, but I think just the external factors that are coming at us just now is kind of driving the priorities. Yeah, and a lot around maintain as well. Um, this question is from Rosie. I'm going to have to hurry up. Uh, there's a good few coming in. As a, someone who is in a team of two at the beginning, I know you said that earlier, you were th that way as well, Karen. What support did you have to get from where you are, to get to where you are, to where you are today? Yeah, so I think we were really lucky in that the vice principal we were reporting to at that point was very behind we really need to do something here. This is not working. Um, and he very much put his trust and faith in our team of two and, and backed us. And that was really key. Um, but I think the other thing that really helped was creating that visibility as to what was going on. Um, there was also an external audit, which gave us some recommendations, which also was incredibly helpful. So having that kind of external view. Um, but yeah, I think really creating that visibility as to what was going on and how it was going really helped build that case for we need to address this. And then they turned to us for, you know, well, how do we address it and how do we, how do we make it better? But certainly some senior level support was really, really important. And we were really lucky that we got that. Excellent. We'll just do one last more. Uh, and if we have time at the end after Linda's presentation, we'll get it. Thanks, Karen. This is from Sean Miller. Uh, can I please ask, where does the IT resources come from? Are they seconded or scheduled within IT in collaboration as work packages? Or are you getting them from some other mechanism? 
Yeah, so it's a real mixture, Sean, in terms of how we are doing that. And um, we always engage with our IT team, both at the planning of the portfolio level, because so much of our initiatives draw on IT resource. So we always include um, senior representatives from IT when we're planning the portfolio and doing that annual refresh um, to make sure that they have a, a an initial view of what things are going to look like and what we're going to draw on from an IT perspective. And then as each project progresses, we do much more detailed planning. Again, IT are always involved in those conversations and we look at whether that can be supported from the existing resource or whether we actually need to put into the business case a request for additional resource to comments etc so very much on a project by project basis but a really key consideration great uh, we have four questions left left we'll get to them in the end if we um, have enough time but uh, we'll move, move over to you now debbie hi everyone um i'm going to introduce you, <laughs> linda mckiver um Linda is Head of PMO at Newcastle University and she leads a team of professionals delivering strategic change and operational change. She has over 20 years experience in project management, business transformation and her areas of expertise include project leadership, portfolio management and stakeholder engagement. Linda is going to talk through her approach to developing a new and emerging portfolio and how to scenario plan. Um, against the uncertain climate that we're in. So, and as before, please feel free to put questions in the chat. There will be an opportunity again, it'll be about 20 minutes again, and then five minutes for questions. So there will be an opportunity at the end to also ask questions. And um, over to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Debbie, Marguerite and Karen. And um, I can't promise to follow very well Karen's excellent presentation there and the, uh, the material that she covered, but I will, I will give it a good old try from Newcastle's perspective. It's fair to say, just while I uh, prepare to um, share my screen there, that Newcastle are at an earlier stage of their portfolio management journey. So there are a lot of similarities in terms of what we've uh, experienced as we've gone along that you've seen in Karen's presentation as to, and some slight differences. We're at a, a slightly lower level of maturity, but we've got a roadmap that we're working to. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with you today. So in terms of some things that you'll probably recognise and I'm sure will resonate with all of you as well, uh, important to us to getting the organisational buy-in to implementing uh, portfolio management for our technology portfolio was about us articulating the problem statement that we had at the time. And you'll have recognised some of this from Karen's presentation as well. We didn't have oversight of that single version of the truth in terms of what was on the books from a project perspective. We had a great sense, but no direct evidence that the demand for change far exceeded our capacity to be able to deliver that. We had limited tracking of initiatives that were springing up around the organisation that involved technology or needed to be technology enabled. And that left us playing catch up uh, in a number of different areas. We're very immature in terms of our resource management and estimation processes and to some extent still are. And I'll come on to that. A little bit later. We, we weren't quite aligned with the budget planning framework. We've done some work to help with that. I won't read through all of these, but you can see the sorts of challenges that we were facing there that really helped us in terms of setting up that approach to technology portfolio management. And one of the things that we did was recognise that we needed some organisational governance that, that across the technology portfolio. And it's important to emphasise that this is organisational level governance. It's not IT governance. And that differentiation has been really important for us. So we've set up our technology portfolio board or TPB, as it's affectionately known as at Newcastle. And it sits in our governance framework as the front door, the doorway onto the technology portfolio. So initiatives can only be approved onto the technology projects portfolio by routing through our technology portfolio board. It has a sister group with our estates portfolio board and routing into our infrastructure strategy group that enables us to have those um, prioritization and strategic alignment discussions across both the physical and the digital estate, but it's the technology portfolio element that we're going to concentrate on today. They have some supporting structures underneath them, um, led by my team uh, who deliver uh, due diligence and that delivery assurance, resource management, architectural alignment. A lot of due diligence goes on there in terms of the requests that route through to our technology portfolio board. But ultimately, they are looking at 
initiatives that are being prioritised by groups all over the university, by our university committees, by other operating structures, by other programme and project boards around the university. They are looking at all of their priorities, which are bubbling up to that technology portfolio board, and they are responsible for the prioritisation of those initiatives onto the technology uh, portfolio. They don't have funding approval. They can only approve onto the technology portfolio. We have to then route up to our financial finance approval groups and the levels that we go to after that are dependent upon our financial regulations. But ultimately, that, that first front door onto the technology portfolio is through that university group technology portfolio board. And I've given here just a flavour of the membership that we have there. Again, important to emphasise this isn't an IT body. This is a university governance body. You can see there we've got representation from our faculties, our education strategy and student experience is represented on the group learning and teaching development. We've got research input into there as well. We've got connectivity across to our organisational strategic change initiatives and that alignment with change management. We obviously have financial oversight on there as well. That's really important for us. The chair of our estates portfolio board also sits on technology portfolio board and vice versa. So we've got that read across, across the digital and the, uh, and the uh, physical estate. And we have IT support there as well. Our technology delivery operations are involved, service delivery and our governance area as well. So that group comes together and currently meets on a monthly basis. And as I mentioned, this has been very much a maturity journey for this group. Um, so they have been meeting on a monthly basis since their inception. And it's proved to be relatively successful in terms of rolling out this high level process about how we get projects from idea, from that ideation phase into in flight. And we've put in a very simple gated process to help that, to help that move along. Anybody essentially in the university can have an idea about a project. We recommend in the first instance that they engage with our IT business partnering unit. They are able to help people look at any lines of similarity, any alignment with other initiatives that are going on across the university. We also ask at that stage that there's some element of organisational sponsorship that comes with these initiatives as well. When, when these initiatives start to flow through, our governance structures, we want to know that they've got some element of organisational mandate behind them and they are more than simply wish list items that they've got some waiting behind them already. They route in through uh, the project management office and through, <coughs> excuse me, our supporting structures into our first gate with what we call our problem and opportunity statement. That is essentially a very simple one page document which articulates the problem that we're trying to solve or the opportunity that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to take advantage of is very much not about solutioning at this stage it's just about articulating the problem or the opportunity in, that we're facing and we'll undertake that due diligence at that phase to make that stage to make sure that these things have architectural alignment that they are aligned with our technology roadmap we'll look at uh, do some light touch resource management uh, assurance across that as well and if we get through that gate, it goes on to be reviewed by our technology portfolio board, who at that point will consider that problem and opportunity for entry onto the technology portfolio. And they themselves undertake the prioritisation um, of that particular initiative using, uh, using a framework that I'll come on to describe next. If that's approved, the approval through gate one is to go and develop a business case. It's not that you have a project to run at that stage, it's to develop a business case. So if you get through gate one, there is then a team that will form that helps develop the business case. And that routes back through, gets that additional due diligence check-in um, and goes through gate two where technology portfolio board review, uh, approve and reprioritize the business case. When you think about our problem and opportunity statement, that one page document, at that stage, it's very light touch in terms of resources, in terms of timelines. Um, when it gets to the business case stage, the final business case, we expect all of those things to be very much more shaped up and we'll have a really good handle on what the ask of the organization is there. So we ask our board to reprioritize the initiative at that stage as well to make sure that it's, it's sitting in the right place organizationally. 
And then if it's approved at that stage, it can route through our financial approvals, one, two, three layers, depending on our financial regulations and the amount of budget that's being asked for. And when it gets through the final uh, set of gates at gate three, we've then got a project that we can start delivering. And it, it's only at that case that we start to consider our initiatives as being in flight. This is our prioritisation framework. Um, it's really quite simple and that reflects, I think, our level of maturity here. We basically have two buckets, for want of a technical term, of projects that we run. We have those that we call run and comply. And these are projects that we pretty much have no option. We have no choice about whether we do these. We, we have to get on and do them. And that's because they are about ensuring uh, compliance from a legal, a regulatory or a statutory perspective, or it's about maintenance of core systems, end of support, end of life of the system. So we have to we have to have a response and we don't really have a choice about, about that. These projects are not subject to prioritisation. They are subject to planning and planning is based on the proximity of the risk that we're trying to mitigate. So there is an assumption, essentially, that there will always be an element of this, these types of projects running through our portfolio, and we will plan forward for those. We then have a second bucket of projects, which we call our Grow Transform projects. And these are the projects that are subject to prioritisation. And the framework that we use is set out there below. We have five criteria that we measure against that are listed down the side there. We weight those criteria based on the importance to us at the time. In fact, we recently uh, went through an exercise where we re-weighted some of these because we recognised that perhaps we hadn't got the weighting quite, quite right. And student and colleague impact was something that, that our technology portfolio board members felt we really needed to be baking in well to our assessments. So you can see we've got those five criteria there and the weighting, and then we have, uh, we're able to assess the problem and opportunity statements and the business cases as they come in based on a series of, of definitions. And ultimately that outputs a score, very similar to how Karen was describing, um, describing for, uh, for St Andrews. Uh, there's a spreadsheet in the background, um, which uh, where we capture this. I would just mention we are actually in the process of implementing a portfolio project and resource management system. So at some point in the not too distant future, excuse me, we're very, uh, our intent is that all of this will take place within the system and we'll be able to use the reporting mechanisms within the system to produce some, some really quite, um, really quite cool insights out of this. But this is the framework that we use. I've been running with this and it's amended form just since the, since the start of this year. And this has worked relatively well for us. So in terms of our portfolio management journey and recognising, I guess, the three key elements that make up portfolio management in terms of prioritisation. Yes, we have a prioritisation framework and we've embedded that within the organisation now. And we've been running with that in one form or another for just over a year now. And in its very new form for about for about six months, we've been running with that. In terms of budget management at the portfolio level. We've made some inroads into that. We've started to get a handle on portfolio level budgeting. And this going into this next financial year is the first year that we've been able to use portfolio budget insights to inform the budget planning process. At a, still at a relatively immature level, but over the next 12 months, we'll be building out that capability um, in order to be able to align better with the budget planning cycle when that starts to hit from the start of the new year onwards. So we've, we've made some inroads into that. The third arm, which is the arm that everybody tells me is the most difficult to do, and I've got no reason to disbelieve them, is the resource management arm. And for us, this means being able to um, map out what our colleagues in IT are working on at any one time. That includes project work and non-project work as well, so that we can, we can start to map out the balance or otherwise between the two. And this is this is a, a journey that we'll be starting on just after the, the summer break, really, to start to embed resource management through the system that we're using in a couple of pilot areas that do a lot of project work. So we can start to see <coughs> what that looks like, what the current state looks like, what our forecasts look like for resource management, and use that 
overlaid with budget management, overlaying on the prioritisation framework as well to start to inform what that forward delivery plan will look like for the future. I'll just take a short drink, sorry. However, we also recognise that we're going into a very extraordinary year at Newcastle in terms of the budget pressures we feel that we'll be under across this financial year. And we recognise that perhaps our prioritisation framework isn't quite sufficient in order to give us the assurances that we're working on the right projects. Perhaps there isn't quite enough nuance in there to help us understand what it is that we need to be working on in times when budgets are particularly constrained. Um, so we are looking at running as a one-off exercise as we head through the summer, something like a zero-based prioritisation exercise. And I've got a, a, some, some extracts from Gartner here to show you what that might look like. And there are certainly, in terms of the Gartner makeup of um, that prioritisation exercise, elements that we recognise from our own prioritisation framework. Um, but this allows us to map uh, using Comparing our current portfolio against an approach like this will allow us to map where our current projects fit in terms of those different types of activity, the mandatory activity all the way up to improvement, as, ma as is mapped out in the bucket there. And this is something that we will be working on with our technology portfolio board over the summer. But as an example, hypothetical example, I took the opportunity to map the current portfolio against something like this zero-based prioritisation framework. And what we could see here was that our current portfolio is made up of a lot of mandatory type projects. These are the ones that you just have to do, the kind of end of system maintenance, uh, uh, legal compliance projects. We have a lot of these mandatory projects in our portfolio. And we have a lot of improvement type projects in our portfolio and we have very little that fits across the band in the middle in this transformation core, differenti core differentiation and growth space but perhaps this is where some of our projects some of our efforts need to fit across this middle band as well as you know keeping the lights on down at the mandatory down at the mandatory level as well the other interesting uh, exercise that I wanted to undertake was to map where the current portfolio budget sat against this. And what's highlighted here in yellow shows the elements of our portfolio which are at risk because they are not planned for in terms of budgets into next year and the years beyond. And I guess worryingly, what you can see here is that we have some things which are currently sat in the mandatory space that would fall um, below the line if we were to set a budget line in terms of a zero based prioritisation approach. But that currently we have no business case for and we have no budget in, in the plan for. There are also some improvement initiatives that have no budget and we have a swathe of things across that middle sector as well. Now, these aren't all of the things that have no budget in for next year which puts a real pressure on the portfolio but puts a pressure on the on the budget as well these are just the notable items these are just the the really that the projects that we would call out as having real organizational significance so it's this kind of analysis that we're going to undertake over the summer in order to help inform what the forward plan going into next year looks like once we've got some surety around student numbers come october time what the forward plan for the next year and years beyond looks like. And this is where we will start to make strides into doing some of the work that Karen and her team have already done, which is starting to inform what the forward plan for the portfolio should look like. And this will this certainly helps us and it helps us organisationally in terms of that budget maturity in the portfolio management space as well. And then just coming to a close there and, and getting ready to wrap up, I guess, just a very simple roadmap for what we're doing in terms of portfolio management and showing what we've achieved so far. We've managed to uh, achieve a baseline prioritised portfolio by taking our technology portfolio board through a prioritisation exercise that they owned. That was really important for them and they continue to own the prioritisation process. So we've got agreement on which projects are on the portfolio and where they sit in the portfolio. We've got our emerging portfolio budget management approach as well, 
which has been very helpful this year in forming the budget planning process. And we'll, we will only mature that across this year <laughs> to feed into the budget management process for next year and beyond as well. We'll start to implement resource management in a, in a very small scale live pilot after the summer with some teams that are very involved in project work. We'll hopefully um, uh, expand that uh, very quickly after that uh, to some other teams who are involved in both project work and enhancement small change type work as well. So we're starting to see different types of work flowing through the portfolio and resource management system. And we can start to generate some insights about how we try and balance, balance the demand out there. And then once we've got all three of those things running through, and this is this is a, a long term plan for us, that's at the point where we believe we we will be delivering project portfolio management, where we're being able to give all of that rich information in terms of portfolio health, forecasting, <coughs> scenario planning and insights. We're very much on a journey to get there. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. We're implementing uh, a system to support us. We're really excited about that. Um, there's a lot of potential there. Um, but we're certainly we certainly still got a lot of work ahead of us to do it. But uh, very happy to share our journey with you today and happy to take any questions afterwards as well. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, Linda. You did uh, great there for time. <laughs> and um, I can tell you're suffering a little bit. As you can see, there's quite a few people um, with you know questions and your colleague Ian's been great answering some as well in the chat. I think um, we've got, is it Oliver with a hand raised? Oliver Davey. Yeah, hi. Um, really good pair of presentations today, I think, from from both. Uh, it's really illuminating a number of these things. I've got a question. I guess it's more for Linda, but maybe it's for both. I mean, we've, we've talked about management of IT things to an IT portfolio, but how do we how do we get a hold of wider projects that have an IT element to them? And maybe we don't find out about that until it's a bit too late. Does that happen? And is there a work being done in these these great initiatives to sort of try and capture that so that it doesn't catch us out by surprise? Yeah, I, I can certainly take that one first, Oliver, from Newcastle's perspective. Um, one of the things we've worked across the last year to 18 months is to make sure that there is only one route to getting um, technology and technology enabling projects underway excuse me and that is through our technology portfolio board route so we've actually been able to we've been quite successful in being able to really minimize and and, and really um remove it projects that are bubbling up elsewhere in the organization because there's only there's only one route there's only one route through to get in order to to get security on that it resource in particular that's really the the rich part of that conversation how do how did we get hold of the it teams that we need to help us with our it project well if they haven't been through our technology portfolio board process you can you cannot do that you have to go through that process in order to be able to secure the resource at our financial approvals layer we have our financial approval groups now who will push back projects that have any IT input required to them that have not been through that route as well. So it's taken quite a lot of engagement and hard work, but we, we have we have started to make some inroads into that. I can maybe just add as well from St Andrew's perspective, I mean, I think I recognise the challenge that you're raising and people will always try and find a back door to, to go through um, if, if they can. Um, and it's by no means perfect, it's better than it was, but it's by no means perfect. And I think what we have been able to do is work in partnership with a few people that can be gatekeepers. So IT themselves, um, if things come on their radar and are not part of the appropriate portfolio, will highlight that to us. Um, but also things like procurement, so where people are trying to go through and actually buy, they will check that you know we are aware of it as well. So that, that's helping to shut those things down and direct people. Um, and over time, hopefully they realise they're not going to get through the back door and they come through the proper process. But it does it does still happen on occasion. There are some questions in the chat <laughs> and it's specifically, I think the first one is um, for Linda, but 
Um, it might also be, you may also have the same question, uh, be able to answer the question. And it was about if you're using any agile delivery methods from Helen Newcomb. Uh, we do, yes. So um, our, our portfolio has a mix of waterfall projects. It has agile projects. It has something, some things that are in the middle as well, sort of hybrid uh, delivery the prioritisation criteria, the whole approach to portfolio management, actually, that I've outlined today, it, um, is agnostic of the type of project that we that we run. Um, we will we will run different types of projects. We'll we'll take a view on which types of projects, which delivery methodology we should use for a particular project as we come to understand more about it. But the the portfolio management process is agnostic of of the type of project itself. Thank you. And there was a question from Peter Hurst for both, <laughs> which was, how much have you found that Run, Grow, Transform throughout press was a thought process, was a surprise for the business and reframed conversations about projects? Happy to go first on this one, Linda. Um, so for me, introducing that concept with our portfolio board actually landed really well. Um, they really liked that concept and they found it an easy way to then view the portfolio and understand what we were doing and, and why. Um, I think they were slightly surprised at how many we were having to do, which was just run. Um, and therefore that was limiting how we could then do those further enhancements, transform, etc. So really easy concept, I think, for them to get their their head around. And I would echo what, what Karen said there as well. Um, our our board members really welcome the simplicity of that categorization. It's quite easy for them to get their their, their heads around that. Um, they have considered and posed the question to me many times, is there is there a situation we might find ourselves in where we're only doing run and comply projects? And the answer is yes, absolutely. That could absolutely be the case. Um, so they're just wrestling with that a, a little bit, but I think our zero based prioritization exercise will will help help them understand that further. Thank you. Thanks both. They were great presentations. I got a lot out of those. I'm, I'm sure um, everybody else did. You've got lots of lovely comments as well, as well as questions. Um, so thank you both, uh, Karen and Linda, for doing that. Thanks to everybody who's turned up and um, come and join us and ask the good questions. And um, thanks to my partner, Marguerite. <laughs> for helping me to organise um, this and we've um, we'd just like to put a couple of things um, and remind people about a couple of things we've got some um, uh, conferences you know in in November and we'd encourage everybody to come if they can there's some early bird pricing there's a link there there's also a plus one scheme you can join our um, JISC mail group there's a link on the slide join the teams group there's a form there and we'll also be sending out some feedback which we'd encourage you to um, to respond to so that we can um, learn and improve from that and if there are any additional questions we didn't get to we will make sure that people are um, the answers are provided for those so um, thank you everybody and uh, have a lovely rest of your afternoon Thanks, so.